So I've been studying this last week. I, I've, I've studied through First and Second Samuel and First and Second Chronicles. And uh, these are some of my favorite passages of Scripture. I know that not everybody feels that way, but there's a passage over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 through 10, or 6 through 11, actually, that says that all of the things that happened in the Old Testament happened for our learning so that we through them might learn not to do these certain things and then to do other things. So this is how God has spoken to me. You know, I haven't personally gone out and committed adultery and done dope and gotten thrown in jail. And I'm not against anybody who has. God loves every one of us. Amen. Amen. <laughs> but I'm just saying that I didn't have to learn everything through making the mistakes myself. God is very candid in the Word of God showing the faults and the failures of people for, so that according to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 6 through 11, we can learn through them. So I learned through these people. These have really impacted me. And so uh, I was studying and specifically I was really bothered, grieved uh, reading about Solomon because when he started out, Solomon was just so awesome. I mean, 1 uh, Kings chapter 3 shows about the Lord appearing unto him and saying, what do you want? Matter of fact, I ministered on this last week because I've been reading in these passages. And he gave Solomon the choice, I'll give you anything you want. And instead of asking for riches or instead of asking for, you know, a huge empire and uh, victory over his enemies and things like that, he told the Lord that he says, I'm a child. I don't know how to go out or to come in. I don't know how to do anything. I need wisdom to guide these people. Man, that was such a pure motive. I mean, it was amazing. This was the most powerful man in the nation, and yet he humbled himself and said, God, I can't go out or come in on my own. I need your help. So anyway, that is awesome. And he started out so good and everything. And yet, if you read in 1 Kings chapter 11, at the end of his life, Solomon turned away from the Lord. His wives turned his heart away from the Lord and he actually started building uh, idols and worshiping idols to, to Moloch and Ashtaroth and all of these, all of his wives. He had a thousand wives, 700 wives and 300 concubines. Makes you wonder why that's considered to be the smartest man. I, I don't think it is. <laughs> And, and specifically, when, when the Lord said that when you get a king, don't multiply wives unto yourself. He also said, don't uh, take horses unto yourself. And David, he didn't even own horses. He had a mule that he rode on. You can see that over in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 20 or, or anyway, it's in there someplace. I'd have to look it up. But he made Solomon, when he made him king, ride upon his mule. So David didn't even have horses uh, because of this command that the Lord had given through Moses. But uh, Solomon had over 40,000 horses and something like 20,000 chariots and things. So he violated what the Lord told him to do. And ultimately, these things turned his heart away from the Lord. And so I was reading these things and the Lord appeared unto Solomon and told him, he says, I've appeared unto you twice and spoken unto you, and yet here you turned away from me. And man, it just grieved my heart to see somebody who at one time walked so closely with the Lord fall away. And you have this question about how can this happen? And I was praying and saying, God, I don't ever want this to happen to me. I don't ever want to get to where I'm insensitive to you. And I ran across this verse, and this is what I was really trying to get to, is in 2 Chronicles chapter 12. This is talking about Rehoboam. He's the grandson of David, the son of Solomon. And in his days, the kingdom was split in two. two. Ten of the tribes went with Jehosh, uh, let's see, Jeroboam. Ten of the tribes went with Jeroboam, and then two of them stayed with Rehoboam. And Rehoboam started out, and it says for the first two years of his reign, he really sought the Lord and to prove to you that he was seeking the Lord, he amassed an army of a, a huge amount of people, hundreds of thousands of people, and he was going to go fight and bring these northern ten tribes back together so that, you know, the twelve tribes of Israel could be together. And so he had amassed, I forget now, but it was over 100,000, up close to 200,000 people. Think about all of the logistics 
of getting 200,000 people together. You had to feed them. You had to have all of the equipment, all of the weapons of war, everything. He was ready to go to battle, and a prophet came out and says, don't go to battle. That because of Solomon's sin, God orchestrated this split, and you'll be fighting against God. And this man just disbanded the whole thing. You know, in modern day terms, it would have been like you spend millions of dollars getting this campaign together, and then you just, because somebody comes up and prophesies to you, you walk away from it. That showed a seeking of the Lord and a submission to the Lord. And yet, after uh, three years, Rehoboam just turned away from the Lord, and he became, um, he became antagonistic and, and uh, in opposition to everything the Lord told him. And anyway, as I was reading here in 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 14, I was reading and thinking, why did this happen? It happened to Solomon. Here's his son. The same thing's happening. And in verse 14, it gives you the answer. He did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. That's the answer. That's why people do what's wrong. You know, I don't know anybody that just wakes up in the morning who's been walking with the Lord and has had a good relationship with the Lord. And I don't know anybody that just wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, today I think I'm going to rebel at the Lord. I think I'll walk away from God. That's not the way that it happens. People that have a relationship with the Lord don't plan to walk away from the Lord, but they don't plan to keep their heart sensitive to the Lord. And, you know, this phrase that I've heard often is that if you don't plan to succeed, then you're planning to fail. It seems like gravity, you know, just always pulls everybody down. In this fallen world, things don't go from disorder to order. They don't go from bad to good. They go the opposite direction. It's easier to catch sickness than it is to catch healing. Mm -hmm. It's easier for you to become poor than it is to become rich. And unless you have plans and uh, specific things that you prepare in, in advance, then it says that he did evil because he prepared not his heart. There goes my microphone. Praise God. <laughs> but he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. So my question to you and my statement here is, are you preparing to stay with the Lord, to continue to walk close with Him? I don't think anybody would sit there and say, well, no, I don't want to be close to the Lord. You may not want it, but have you on purpose prepared your heart to walk with the Lord? And let me just share some other scriptures with you that the Lord put with this. There's a lot of things here in Psalms chapter 10. I wish I had time to read the entire chapter, but let me just jump down to Psalms chapter 10 and in verse 17, it says, Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear. So this specifically says that God prepares the heart of people who are humble. Hmm. Now that needs some explanation because some people think humility is having low self-esteem, thinking bad about yourself. They look at it as being weakness and stuff, but Jesus said that he was meek and lowly in heart, and we know that he didn't have low self-esteem and he wasn't weak. He was he was God, perfected, manifest in the flesh. In uh, Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, it says that Moses was the meekest man on the face of the earth, and the thing that makes that so powerful is Moses is the one who wrote it. Yeah. And so there's nothing wrong, or there's nothing weak about being meek and being humble. So I could spend a lot of time on that, but the Lord says that if you humble yourself, to me, humility can be defined in a couple of ways. One of them is absolute dependence upon God. For instance, I was talking earlier about Solomon saying in 1 Kings chapter 3 that God, I don't know how to go out and come in. Here he was the king. He was the mightiest man in the nation, and yet instead of projecting and, and portraying that he had it all figured out and all together, he humbled himself, and he says, I don't even know how to go out or come in. That humility is saying that, God, I'm dependent upon you. I need you. If you aren't dependent upon God. If you are a self-made man or a woman and you're one of these that, man, you take charge and God, I can handle it. I can do all of these things. There's a lot of people that will say things like, I can do all things. That's not true. 
It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You need to put that together with what Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, says, without me, you can do nothing. Now, the good news is we're never without Jesus. Amen. And so we don't have to sit here and have a low self-esteem, but we need to have a attitude that, God, I am 100% dependent upon you. Uh, uh, Psalms chapter 30, where is this? Psalms chapter 37, I believe, verse... I just went blank. I've quoted this verse so many times. But anyway, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. That right there is humility, is trusting in the Lord and not leaning unto your own understanding. If you're a person who just does your own thing and you only turn to the Lord when you crash and burn and your way didn't work and you turn to the Lord to get you out of a mess, you aren't a humble person. You may not consider yourself proud because you may not be arrogant, but if you are doing things your own way, that's not humility. Anyway, I could share a lot more about that. But it says that the Lord will prepare the heart of a humble person. So one of the ways to get your heart prepared so that you don't do evil is to constantly, just every single day, recognize your absolute dependence upon God, that God, I need you today. I can't make it without you. I don't know how to do anything. And when you get that attitude that you are trusting in the Lord and not trusting in your own wisdom, God prepares your heart. And here's another thing about this. You know, the uh, word uh, pr for prepare in the Hebrew here is the Hebrew word kun, K-U-W-N. And it literally means to establish or to fix or to set. It was translated all of those different ways. Matter of fact, let me just show you this one instance that that same Hebrew word, K-U-W-N, was translated in Psalms chapter 57. And if you read this in some Bibles, in this Bible that I've got, the subscript of this is, it says, To the chief musician, out tasketh Mictam of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. So it tells you the occasion that caused him to write this psalm. And this is going back to, I believe it's Second Samuel chapter, uh, or First Samuel chapter 24, and it's where uh, Saul was trying to kill David, and he came against him with 3,000 men. David had 600 men. They went and hid in a cave, and Saul came into the cave and I believe fell asleep, and the, the guys that were with David said, this is your opportunity. Kill Saul and take the kingdom. And he, he started to do it, but he couldn't do it. And instead, he just cut off a portion of Saul's robe. And when Saul walked out of the cave, then David walked out behind him, bowed down, and he says, why are you listening to people say that I'm out to harm you? Today, you see that God delivered you into my hand, and the people that were with me bade me to kill you, but I didn't. And here's proof of it, because here's part of your robe right here. And so anyway, my point is this is the occasion and look at what he said. Again, I'm not going to take time to read this entire chapter, but if you go down to verse 7, he says, My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. That word fixed right there is the exact same word that was uh, translated prepared over in 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 14. And it's talking about that it was established, that it was fixed, it was set. And here's one of the points that I'm trying to make through this. It says he prepared not his heart. You know, when you prepare something, it means you do it in advance. Like if Julianne was coming over to have supper or something with Jamie and me, and she got here, and then Jamie says, well, I'm going to go prepare the food or something, that means that you do it in advance. You don't wait until it's done and then say, all right, I'm preparing. No, you prepared and now you're partaking of it. When you prepare your heart, you have to do this in advance. And see, there's a lot of people that they've never made these determinations. They've never sit there and said, I will never under any circumstances ever commit this sin. I am never going to do dope. I will never get drunk. I will never commit adultery. There's a lot of people that they don't want to do those things. They love the Lord, 
but they haven't prepared their heart. They haven't made commitments in advance. And so they wait until they're in a situation. And then when they're tempted, they've got a decision to make. Am I going to yield to this or not? See, I've already made my decision. I have literally made my decision. I had my uh, granddaughter over at the house last Christmas and we were playing games and I forgot how we got on this. But anyway, she was saying something about if people, if they tried to force you to do something, would you do it? And I said, no, absolutely not. I am never going to go against what God told me to do. And she said, what if they took me and put a gun to my head and said, you renounce the Lord or I'll kill your granddaughter. And I said, I wouldn't renounce the Lord. And she was shocked, like, you would do that to me? And I said, I've already determined that there is nothing that would ever cause me to renounce the Lord. But see, there's a lot of people that have never gone that far. And so if they were put into a compromising situation, well, then they have to decide at that moment, am I going to stay faithful to the Lord? You need to prepare your heart in advance. You need to say that I am always going to live like this. This is who I am. This is who God called me to be. And unless you prepare your heart, well, then I can guarantee you Satan is going to come against you every single way possible. And if you haven't already made the commitment, if you haven't prepared in advance of the temptation, then you're going to give in. And it just really simplifies life when you make a decision that, you know what, I am never going to steal. I'm never going to lie. I will not do these things. This is not who I am, and I will not live that way. Now, if you fail in that, of course, there's plenty of grace and forgiveness, and God is not a legalist and a perfectionist. But I'm saying you need to prepare your heart. And this word was also translated set in other places in Scripture. And you know what this reminds me of is that I was a... Uh, uh, concrete finisher before I started into the ministry. And we would pour concrete and it started out pliable, but then you would put it into these forms and you would trowel it and do these things and then it would set up. And we often use the terminology about, you know, once the concrete is set, you aren't going to get rid of it unless you go and jackhammer it. And our heart is kind of like that. When you're young, your heart is pliable and it's responding to many different things. But as you walk with the Lord, you need to prepare or, or fix or set your heart and it becomes hardened, not towards God, but hardened towards the devil. In the same way that a person can have a hard heart towards the Lord and be insensitive towards Him, did you know you can become insensitive to the devil to where you honestly don't know how to listen to the devil? Yeah. You don't know how to hear the devil. You can just predetermine these things. And I tell you, it makes life so simple because I don't have to sit here and struggle and say, oh, God, help me not to do this thing because I've already determined. Man, I ran up a white flag on March the 23rd, 1968, and I totally committed myself to God. I've never done it perfectly. In the times that I fail, there's plenty of mercy and grace and forgiveness, but I'm saying that I made a commitment. I started preparing my heart 52 years ago. And because of that, it has just made my life so simple. I don't have to get up in the morning and wonder about, am I still going to be serving the Lord by the time night comes? And you know, I know some people that honestly, they are passionate. They are excited about the Lord, but the truth is they don't have any assurance that next month they'll still be serving the Lord. It just depends on what happens. That's not a good way to live. But you can fix your heart. You can establish your heart. You can prepare your heart, and it will keep you from doing evil. And I tell you, that is powerful. And I know that some of you don't have that sense of security. You don't have that relationship with the Lord. Right now, you love the Lord. I mean, you're watching a Bible study. You could be doing all kinds of things, but you are listening to somebody talk about the Lord, and you love the Lord right now, but you need to just take away your options. Yeah, amen. You need to take all of these options off the table. Just get down to where, God, you are Lord I am going to serve you and I'm going to obey you to the very best of my understanding. If it costs me my life, if it costs me my wife, if it costs me my money, if it costs me anything, you need to go ahead and make those decisions and prepare in advance 
because Satan will try and come and steal from you what God has given. The Bible says that the thief comes immediately to steal away the word that's been sown in your heart. And you just need to prepare your heart and, and fix it that, you know what, I will never live this way. I will not do it. You can't make me do it. I'll end with this and then we'll take some questions. But I remember a man, he and his wife were very famous. I mean, if I was to give the name, you'd know who I'm talking about. But anyway, he and his wife were actually involved in a marriage ministry. Now, they weren't the ones who led it, but they were celebrities and they spoke for this marriage ministry. And anyway, because they were putting pressure on a lot of ungodly people, these ungodly people hired a woman who uh, they hid in his hotel room when he was out traveling someplace by himself. And she came out when he was in the hotel room and I think she was naked. And anyway, she enticed him and got him into bed and they had sex and they had somebody there to take pictures of it. And it just exposed them and it ruined whatever marriage ministry they had. And it was a total setup. He wouldn't have gone out and have done this on his own. But when he was put in that situation, he gave into it. And he and his wife were discussing this and saying it was a setup. It was, he didn't really do this himself. He was forced into this. But when I heard that, I thought, you couldn't force me. You couldn't put me in a situation that would make me do that. I'd be like Joseph in the... Uh, 39th chapter of the book of Genesis that, you know, his master's wife tried to force him to have sex with her. And man, he, she grabbed his coat and he just took his coat off and ran out of the house and fled. I would be like that. I've already predetermined it. You could not put me in a situation that would make me compromise my convictions to the Lord. Now, let me add this little asterisk to it. That's the way I am right now because I've been preparing my heart for 50 something years. But my heart could be corrupted the same as anybody's good. And if I was just to make a decision that, you know, from now on, I'm not going to really seek the Lord. I'm just going to start goofing off and not studying the Word and not praying and not seeking the Lord. Well, my heart could become insensitive to God the way that anybody else is. I believe I'm capable of doing anything that anybody else is, but I'm not capable of it today because I've been preparing my heart. And I don't know how long it takes for your heart to become insensitive to the Lord. I'm not going to find out. But uh, it would take years. It would take me years, I believe, to get into a position where you could make me compromise my convictions. So I'm saying all of these things to you, especially those of you that haven't walked with the Lord very long and you are maybe fearful about losing your passion and your zeal for the Lord. You determine all of this. You can prepare your heart. You can make these decisions up front and keep from falling away from the Lord. That's really powerful. I just happen to have a three teaching series on this, how to prepare your heart. It's really good. Amen. You could call that number and they'd give you that. Yes. Um, you also have um, how to be a giant killer, mm -hmm. which you get into real depth about David, which is really good. And then I also was thinking about how to have an excellent spirit where you talk about yeah. Daniel too. Yeah, and it's that's all, really good. It's, all, the, it's the same lines. stuff. Yeah. And, you know, what I realized is uh, when I look back at my past and how it like, how do you get to that place? It's one bad decision at a time. And it's the little decisions, you know, because I feel like a lot of people think, well, uh, I know I've set my heart that I would never commit murder. But if you don't choose those little decisions, um, and Most people don't go away from the Lord all at once. It's step by step. And right. it's the same thing going, going the other to, direction. Right. It's a process. And that's what this is talking about. It's just a process of Amen. every day getting up and saying, God, thank you that today I am committed to you and I will not change. Amen. Praise God. So we have some great questions. Thank you, everyone. So JKD on YouTube says, how do I live in the balance of I can't do live this life without you, Father, and Thank you for you for never leaving me, Father. So how do you live in the balance of I can't do anything without you, but yet I'm never without you? You know, it's really a good question because yeah. those look like opposing forces, but they actually are complementary forces. Amen. You, if you don't have a, an awareness that God without you, I'm nothing, then it will always lead to independence from God. 
And that leads to disaster. I guarantee you uh, that's what caused everything. When Adam and Eve were deceived, thinking I was better off to disobey God and to eat this fruit, that's what destroyed their lives. We need to have this absolute dependence upon God, recognizing, God, I'm nothing without you. But if you stay there, that'll destroy you too. It's to me like walking on a tightrope. You see these people holding a balance beam. And you know what? You've got to, you've got to balance, you use that balance beam to keep you on track. If you grab just one end of that pole, the very pole that gives stability to you when you have it balanced properly, that thing will pull you one direction or the other. And it's the same thing. If you get focused on your inability and that's all you focus on, that leads to defeat in this thing where you approach God like a beggar. God, I have nothing. I can do nothing. And that's not good. But if you go the other direction where I can do all things, but the emphasis isn't on through Christ. It's you get into who you are and you get into your talents and abilities. That's what leads people astray. So anyway, they, they appear to be opposing forces, but they actually balance each other. The best teaching I have on that, I think, is uh, living in the balance of grace and faith. And that would really deal with that exact question. Yeah, amen. Um, so Daniel on YouTube says, I know that God opposes the proud and that pride is the source of all contention. Sometimes I find myself being self-centered and not Christ-centered. Do I just turn to the Word? Well, everybody is that way by nature. I've also often used this example that children don't come into the world, uh, you know, uh, putting other people first. No. They put themselves first. I mean, they... They wake their mother up. She's been up all night giving birth and needs to get some rest. And they don't care. They'll wake her up. They'll cry. You take a child into a church service. There could be a thousand people there wanting to listen to the word. They don't care. They'll just make a scene and throw a fit. We are all come into this world self-centered. And so every one of us has to deal with this self-issue and when you recognize that you're self and that you're just thinking about yourself and promoting yourself and stuff, you don't need to be condemned, but you need to recognize that that is not the way that Jesus is. He told us to be like him and he loved us more than he loved himself. John chapter 13, Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Did you know that even goes above the Old Testament commandment of loving your neighbor as yourself? Now, that's good as far as it goes, but loving people the way that Christ loved them is even better than loving your neighbor as yourself because Jesus loved his neighbor more than himself. And so it's a, it's a battle. And once you start humbling yourself and putting God and other people ahead of yourself, it starts paying rewards. It actually is, it's exciting to humble yourself and to see God come through and to see God bless you and stuff. And it's a process, but you will start experiencing positive results out of it. And after a while, you'll get to where you actually enjoy walking in humility with the Lord more than you do in promoting yourself. It's a process, but it's a renewing of your mind. Praise God. That's really good. Um, so Brenda on YouTube says, is it wrong to pray for strength in areas you fear you might fall? Well, it depends what, what she means by strength. Okay. Like say, for instance, if a person's struggling with alcohol or something, it's certainly not wrong for them to pray, God, oh, help me get over this thing. Take away this desire if you're hooked on drugs or something like that. I don't think it's wrong to pray for strength in those areas, but at the same time, it's really positive for you to come up and say, God, I've tried this on my own and I've failed. And I'm just admitting that I can't do this on my own. I need you to uh, help me to overcome this. And so, again, this, this is a balance between these things. Some people just say, all right, I'm going to overcome this because I can do anything through Christ. And you're doing it in your really your own self-ability that'll lead you to failure. Even if you win for a period of time, it's like gravity. You know, I could take this Bible. This Bible is not heavy. And look, I'm overcoming gravity. I'm holding this thing up. But I can guarantee you, if I just stay like this, gravity will win every single time. I can only do this so long. If I did it for five hours, that would be amazing. But I can guarantee you after six hours or sometime, 
gravity is going to win. And if you're trying to overcome the flesh in just your own natural ability, you will lose every time. So there is benefit to coming to the end of yourself. That's where you find God. Amen. Is when you come to a place like Solomon that says, God, I'm a child. I can't do this on my own. You've given me something bigger than me. And there is, there's benefit to just coming to the end of yourself and saying, God, help. <laughs> Amen. And that's when God shows up. And then He won't do it for you. He will do it through you. But there's a difference when you are resisting like dope addiction, uh, alcohol, uh, temptation, lust, pornography. There's, a di there's things that you have to do, but there's a difference in God doing it through you and you doing it in your own strength and power. And it's a hard attitude. I can't, I can't look at you and describe whether you're doing right or not. God's the only one that knows your heart. But when you come to the end of yourself and say, God, I just need you. I can't do this without you. There's strength. That's where you really find power. I think a lot of times we're drawing on strength to deal with the fruit and we're not going to the root. Because for me to get free from those gross sins, I had to go to the root, which was identity. Absolutely, absolutely. And then that's when that supernatural strength comes through because your whole mind changes and you go, why would I want to do that? Y'all look at Julianne and think, well, this woman, she's never had a problem. But, oh, you know, her testimony goodness. is that when she came to school, she was still going to bars at night. And it right. took her a while to get set free. And from I can't tell you how many times I thought I had fixed my heart because I would tell God, I'm never going to do this again. And then I would do it again. And then would come the guilt and the condemnation. So that's why I'm saying that was the fruit of a, a root issue. And the root issue was my identity was completely skewed. My idea of who God was was completely skewed. So I think sometimes when we're calling for help and strength for these gross sins, it's just a fruit. If you see yourself as a party girl, as a person that's that goes to the bars, and if that's your identity... right. Well, then you're going to act it out. It's a right. self-fulfilling prophecy. But when you found out that, man, that's not who I am. I'm a new person in Christ. Right. Then that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. So praise that's God. very good. So you'll get through that, Brenda. Uh, number, let's see, Gail. Sorry, I'm putting numbers on here. Uh, so Gail on YouTube says, what would keep a person from being confident, from being confident to protect their heart and stand firm? So what would keep them from being confident enough to protect their heart and stand firm? Well, what you were just talking about, if you got a wrong identity, like say, for instance, you've had a number of failures, you've had a failed marriage, you've lost your job, you've hurt other people, uh, you know, just multitude of things. And that gives you an identity that I'm, I'm a loser. Yeah. Well, then as long as you see yourself as a loser, you, that's eventually who you will be. But when you see who you are in Christ, this is what changed my life because I was raised to believe that I got born again when I was eight years old. And I mean, I knew I was saved. If I was to die, if I'd have died then, I'd have gone to heaven. I had no doubt about that whatsoever. I was saved, but the church I grew up in said I was an old sinner saved by grace. And I didn't think that salvation as far as, you know, anything really happening started until I went to heaven. And so here I was saved, but I was stuck. And I was an old sinner and I saw myself weak and inadequate. And then I had this encounter with the Lord and I found out who I was in Christ. And I mean, my life just took off like a rocket Amen. because when I, I started seeing that I could lay hands on the sick and they would recover. I never had even thought that before. I'd thought, man, I can't do a thing with my hands. But when I saw who I was in Christ and, and stuff, it changed me. So Amen. it's Praise what God. you were talking about. You got to change your identity, find out who you are in Christ. Amen. Um, so Silly Silly on YouTube says, is learning to hear God better part of preparing our hearts? What is a concrete way we can better hear the Lord? I would say that preparing your heart will cause you to hear God better Ooh. <laughs> instead of the other way around. That's good. In other words, every time you make a decision, you get up in the morning and say, today, this day is given to God. You know, you may have to start on a daily basis instead of thinking 20 and 30 years out in the future and just say, today, I am not going to be self-centered. Today, I am not going to use profanity. I am not going to lose my temper. I am not going to do whatever it is that you're struggling with. 
And when you start making those decisions, I guarantee you, you're going to have to draw on the power of God to fulfill that. You won't be able to do it in yourself. And so throughout the day, you'll be calling out and you have something happen and man, you start to blast somebody and let them have it. And that old you wants to come out and the Holy Spirit will speak to you and remind you of your commitment and bring scriptures to your remembrance. And if you respond positively to it and overcome, well, then the next day you will hear God better because you've made your heart a little bit more sensitive. But if you just go do your own thing and you, you do whatever it is that's your weakness and stuff, you've hardened, you put a layer of insensitivity between you your heart and God. But every time you obey Him and yield to Him, you make yourself just a little bit more sensitive to Him. It's Praise a process. God. Praise God. Okay, so uh, last question. You guys have amazing questions today, so thank you for that. Uh, Anita D. on YouTube says, can we always be perfect all the time with a prepared heart? Well, I think, yes, you could. Uh, it's possible. <laughs> but I don't know anybody that's ever done it. I certainly haven't done it. Uh, there are some people, there are some religious people that teach you reach a place of sanctification where you cannot sin. I don't believe that you ever reach where you cannot sin. I believe you can live a life where you don't sin all the time. There's a guy, I won't mention his name, but he was a pastor of a church and he got up at the eight o'clock service on Sunday morning and he asked all of the people, he says, so who in here has sinned today? And every single person raised their hand and his wife was in the service. And so he just stopped and he says, I want to know what you've done. And she says, well, I, I can't think of anything, but I just know that I constantly fail the Lord. And, and she just, most people live in a, with a sense of sin consciousness. But you do not have to sin every day. Certainly by eight o'clock in the morning, you shouldn't <laughs> have already sinned. But see, there's some people that think, no, I sin every day. I don't believe you have to live that way. I, I don't, I'll, I'll say this, that the sins that I commit aren't the sins of commission as much as they are the sins of omission. I fail to be the husband I should be. I fail to think about other people the way that I should and stuff. But I don't go out and steal and cuss and do things like that. I've overcome most of those kind of things. And you can live a life that is free from just constantly sinning in things. You do not have to sin all of the time. But I believe that you will still fall short of being the person. You never pray as much. You are never as compassionate. You could always operate in the gifts of the Spirit better and things like that. Amen. Well, we've come to an end, you guys. So uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, make sure and tune in tomorrow, bright and early, 7 a.m. Who's going to be on, do you know? Uh, tomorrow is Rick McFarland. Oh, good. Yes, Pastor Rick. He, he's, a, he's a great minister, and you'll, you'll really enjoy him. And Julianne will be there. We've got yep. uh, Carrie is taking a week off. They are on vacation, and man, they need it. Yeah, they do. I'm We've super been working happy for them, them hard. So, so anyway, Thank you for joining. Remember that if you have any questions about this and all of these different products that Julianne mentioned, mentioned mm -hmm. our people on our helpline, they have all of these things you can call in and say, which was the one about preparing your heart or about, you know, uh, or about David, like David, how to become yeah. a giant killer. They can give you all of that information. Excellent spirit. There's mm. and they can pray with you. Six, yes. uh, seven, one, nine, six, three, five, 1111. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.